Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. I'm Rustin Leno. Welcome to um, the second annual Synquid uh, talk series talk. Um, 365 days ago, uh, Nadia uh, came here to, uh, to give a talk on Synquid. So since it's now 365 days later, it seems like um, we have a pattern going. Um, uh, Nadia Polikarpova got her PhD from ETH in Zurich a few years ago and has since been at, at MIT as a postdoc. And she is no, um, uh, no stranger to our neck of the woods. She has um, been here as an intern a few years ago, working with Miha Moscow. She has worked on uh, a number of different verification tools. Uh, she's used VCC, she's used Daphne, she has worked on Daphne, she has worked on the Eiffel tool auto, uh, Autoproof, she's used Boogie, she's right, written the tool Boogaloo, and the list goes on and on. But today, she's going to talk about Syncwid, so take it away. Thanks, Rustan, uh, for this great introduction. So today I'm actually going to talk about a bit more broadly uh, about type-driven program synthesis. So first, uh, why do we want uh, program synthesis? Well, in the last couple of decades, uh, programming languages have come a long way. And um, developing programs today in uh, today's mainstream languages is definitely way easier than it used to be in machine code. But, uh, and yet, uh, writing uh, programs, and especially correct programs, is still surprisingly hard. Um, and if we want to improve um, software quality and increase programmer productivity, uh, one way to do this is to offer programmers new ways of describing computation that are more high level and more declarative than what um, conventional programming languages offer today. And um, one um, obstacle to achieving this goal is this gap that arises between these high-level declarative specifications that programmers are expected to write and uh, uh, the performance that they uh, have come to expect from mainstream programming languages. And in recent years, program synthesis has emerged as a, a way of bridging this gap by using powerful search algorithms to um, translate the declarative specifications automatically into efficiently executable code. So uh, program synthesis technology has the potential to enable a whole new generation of programming languages in which programmers directly specify requirements on their software, uh, like functional properties, resource bounds, or cross-cutting concerns like security policies, and uh, have the code automatically generated that provably adheres uh, to those policies and requirements. And today I will talk about two such synthesis-enabled languages. The first one, as Russo mentioned, is called Synquid. And uh, you might have heard me talk about it before, for example, a year ago here. Uh, but it has come a long way since then. So I would like to give you a quick, quick update. Synquid, for those of you who don't know, um, uses a synthesis technology to uh, produce programs from scratch uh, given a functional specification. And the second language I'm going to uh, talk about is called Lifty. And Lifty uses uh, program synthesis to rewrite existing programs uh, in such a way that they adhere to uh, information flow policies. All right, and both of those languages, uh, as their language of declarative uh, specifications, they use expressive types, and hence the title of my talk, uh, Type Directed Synthesis. Okay, let me start by illustrating what's so hard about program synthesis. And namely, the hardest thing is that the source space of programs that the synthesizer has to consider grows just way too fast with the size of the program. So imagine you want to synthesize a program that makes a list with n copies of value x. Um, 
it's here we uh, wrote the specification in a natural language, but of course the specification doesn't have to be in natural language. In fact, if we want to obtain any kind of correctness guarantees about the result, it better be in some formal notation, but it should be on a similar le high level of abstraction. Uh, one uh, possible way to translate this into an efficient implementation is this recursive functional program uh, written here. So how would we go about generating such a program? Well, the naive way of doing it would be, let us fix some reasonable set of primitive components and start enumerating all the, um, all the uh, abstract syntax trees made up of those components in the order of increasing depth. And for each of those programs, we can check whether it satisfies the declarative specification. Well, unfortunately, with as few as five components, there are two, around two to the 50th different programs of uh, the depth less or equal to this one. So even if we could check each of these programs in just one machine cycle, we would still spend several hours trying to exhaust this search space. So this is definitely no good. How do we avoid having to consider so many programs? And in this work, um, the kind of the answer to this question that we pursue is um, that the key to scalable synthesis is modular verification. And I'm going to illustrate this with an analogy. Imagine you want to break a combination lock. This is a hard problem because the verification mechanism of the lock is non-modular. It will only tell you uh, whether you got the whole combination correct or not. But now imagine there's someone uh, looking over your shoulder and telling you for each digit whether you got it right. Um, if you had this mechanism, your lock picking job would be very easy. And that's exactly what we want in program synthesis. So if you want to come up with a program that is made up of um, many little subterms, what we would like to do is to decompose uh, our overall global specification for the program so that we can enumerate and validate each of those component subterms independently from the others so that we uh, avoid considering most of their combinations. So how do we come up with such a model, uh, modular verification mechanism that will help us um, to do uh, synthesis in a practical way? Well, the first step is picking the right specification language. So what, are the what, what makes a specification language synthesis friendly? Well, as we mentioned, it has to be on a high level of abstraction, has to be abstract and concise. It should be sufficiently expressive for uh, developers to be able to state the properties that they want. But uh, also very importantly, it has to support automatic and modular verification. And in our work, we found that refinement types, and in particular the flavor of refinement types used in liquid Haskell, um, was, uh, satisfies all of those three requirements. Uh, let, me, uh, let me show you what those refinement types are and how we can use them um, in synthesis. So I will show you a demo of our tool that is called Syncwit. So this is the web interface to Syncwit, which you can all um, play with. I will give you a link towards the end of the talk. And in this demo, we will ask Syncrit to synthesize exactly that program I showed you before, the one that makes a list with n copies of x. How do we ask Syncrit to synthesize that program? Well, let's start by specifying just the conventional, uh, let's say, ML or Haskell style type for replicate. Well, we can say that replicate takes an n that's an integer and an x of an arbitrary type a and produces a list of a's. So if we, um, so as, actually as simple as it is, this type already tells us a lot about the function. In particular, it tells us, it guarantees that every value in the resulting list is going to be equal to x. And why is that? It's because the implementation of this function has to work for any type a. And the function has no way of constructing any other values of type a other than x. Pretty cool, huh? And, and now if we run a syncwit on this input, what we get is a constant program that always returns an empty list. But this is not surprising because we didn't tell syncwit anything uh, about the length of this list. 
So nil is a perfectly fine solution. To specify the, the length of the list that we want, we will refine the return type of this function with a predicate. And the predicate will tell us that the length of this value is equal to n. Here, underscore v is a, a special keyword that um, a standard name for a variable that ranges over the values of the type. We will also refine uh, the type of the uh, argument n to say that it has to be a natural number. And that's because um, we cannot make a list of a negative length. And in fact, for this particular type, we already have a predefined synonym that's called nat. So with this specification in place, we can ask Synquid for a solution, and it generates exactly the program that we expected in fractions of a second. All right, so now that I have shown you uh, this tool in action, let me explain to you a little bit about how it works. Uh, was it the only program in the space of valid programs? Um, that was the shortest one. So Synquid um, enumerates programs. Um, roughly in like smaller to larger. It was the first one that it found. It can happen that if you didn't, um, if the specification you provided is not strong enough, then the first program it finds is not the one that you wanted. In fact, that ha that's what happened to us in the first um, try. And then you just have to strengthen the specification. In the space of programs, uh, does it consider all possible library functions or how? Uh, uh, so, right, you have to, in fact, Synquid doesn't have any default library functions built in at all. You have to give it all the components that you want it to use. In fact, here, I just didn't want to bother you with the details. But here at the bottom of this file, um, I have the components that Synquid is using here. So those are constant zero, increment, decrement, and inequalities. OK, let me give you a quick um, glimpse of how this actually works. Well, as I mentioned before, Synquid relies crucially on the verification mechanism behind uh, refinement types, which is called refinement type checking. So let me uh, explain to you very quickly how refinement type checking works, and then it would be very easy to understand how the synthesis actually works. So the refinement type checking uh, problem it uh, can be in general described like this. Given a uh, program term E and a refinement type T and an environment gamma, you have to determine whether this program term has this type in this environment. right? And what, what's in the environment is basically a list of variable bindings that, that lists all the variables in scope together with their refinement types. Um, so in a more, uh, more precisely, our problem is to find a type derivation or a proof tree um, that has this judgment uh, that is given to us in our problem as the root. And the tree is made up of valid applications of inference rules of our type system. So which, this is how um, all kinds of proofs and type derivations usually work. Right? So. Um, let me give, me give you an example of a type derivation. Uh, so here we want to check if this program, lambda x, replicate 5x, which is where replicate is the function that we have just seen, has the type, uh, it takes a negative number to a list of negative numbers of length 5, which intuitively is true. And here gamma would, cons uh, would have the following components, 5, of the list constructors, and replicate. This is just a very simple example. So I'll show you this derivation here. You don't have to read the details of the derivation, but I just wanted to point out a couple of challenging moments about uh, refinement type checking. So the first thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, some up applying some, inference, some of the inference rules requires um, deciding subtyping between two refinement types. So uh, in particular here, we have to decide whether a singleton type that just contains the integer 5 is a subtype of the type of natural numbers. And as you can see, because those types contain refinements, uh, this includes deciding some kind of implication over the refinements. But in this particular flavor of refinement types, the 
the refinements are chosen from a decidable logic. And this is why we can safely use an SMT solver to decide this implication and obtain decidable verification. The second point that is even a bit more challenging is that whenever we are using um, a component of a polymorphic type, like replicate here, we actually have to guess what to instantiate the type with, right? And since our types are refined, it means we don't only have to guess the shape of the type, like the conventional type, like integer, but we have also to guess the refinement, which satisfies a whole system of subtyping constraints, which is not, in general, very easy. So here, for example, we had to guess that we have to instantiate alpha with a type of negative numbers, right? And it turns out that predicate abstraction can do that. And in fact, this um, uh, mechanism for refinement type checking that uses SMT solver and predicate abstraction has been proposed in uh, 2008, and it's called liquid type inference. So that already exists. Um, how do we go from here to type-driven synthesis? Well, a type-driven synthesis problem looks almost the same, except the program is unknown. Well, that is actually not as big a deal as you think, because we used to, we had to look for, um, we had to look through a bunch of derivation trees that, satis that have uh, a certain root, and now we have to do exactly the same thing. We have to look at a bunch of derivation trees um, that have this kind of root. It's just that we have to look at more trees now, because less information about them is known. And in fact, this is kind of the, the central idea of type-directed synthesis, is that you're not just enumerating programs, but you're enumerating derivation trees in the hope that you'll be able to discover an incorrect tree early on before you construct the whole tree all the way down to the leaves, and you can uh, discard the partial tree, whereby discarding a whole space of um, invalid uh, candidate programs. Right. Um, so here, for example, um, we, we are hoping that we could um, discover a type error before even considering other branches of this derivation. But unfortunately, not every type checking mechanism is able to actually uh, type check partial trees. So in fact, the liquid type inference that I've shown you in the previous slide it needs, um, it, it propagates all the type information uh, bottom up from the leaves to the root. So it actually needs the whole tree to be there to even start solving the subtyping constraints. So we had to modify the type system and the type checking mechanism to make it applicable to these partial trees so that we can discard them as soon as possible. And in fact, our um, synthesis mechanism is based on these two key ideas. The first one is what we called round trip type checking. Round trip type checking, unlike the bottom up type checking of, of the previous approach, it tries to maximize uh, the type information that is propagated top down from the root to the leaves. Um, and in fact, there's more type information than propagated bottom up, and hen hence the name round trip. Um, and this basically um, <clears throat> allows us to discard those partial trees as early as possible. So round trip type checking is a modification of the type system that allows us to do this. Um, and the second, uh, the second uh, contribution of our approach is called liquid abduction. Well, basically, think about this. So a partial uh, derivation tree generates a, um, a partial system of uh, subtyping constraints. And you want to be able to um, to determine if that system is unsatisfiable before you got all the constraints. And in fact, um, to be able to do this, you need, uh, you need logical abduction. So you need to be able to discover the weakest refinements that satisfy the system of subtyping constraints so that uh, you can see when those weakest refinements are actually vacuous, vacuous. they're actually false. And in that case, you know that there is no way to complete the tree because it requires a vacuous type. So we uh, combine predicate abstraction with uh, <clears throat> the ability of SMT solvers to produce unsatisfiable cores uh, to actually enhance that um, liquid type inference algorithm to be able to discover those weakest, uh, so weakest refinements. 
And almost as a side effect to that, liquid abduction gives us an efficient way to discover uh, guards of, of branching expressions. So I don't really have time to go in, in detail um, uh, about those um, features of Syncrit. So if you want to talk about it with me offline, I'll be happy to. Or uh, Syncrit is also has been published at PLDI this year, so you can read our paper. Um, I will just show you the results of our evaluation. So we applied a Syncrit to 64 benchmarks taken from the previous work on um, synthesis of recursive functional programs and verification as well. So uh, they include list programs, but also programs that manipulate uh, more um, complex data structures like binary search trees and even um, balance trees. And Syncrit, in fact, is the first um, synthesizer to generate provably correct implementations of certain algorithms and operations on AVL trees and um, red blood trees. And it's also pretty efficient. Yeah. What is the length of these benchmarks? What is, what is the maximum length of the program? Uh, the program that was generated. Uh, the biggest, so we measured them in AST nodes. I think the biggest one was around 300 AST nodes. But I have to say that it's a sort of a stupid program. So, I mean, I always find that the length of, of like the size of a program is not the best measure because sometimes it's much harder to generate, you know, a shorter program, but that works um, on a bigger set of inputs, for example. So that particular program, what it does, it constructs um, a binary heap of size three. So it's given three values and it just like compares them each, like every way. And like for each kind of outcome constructs a different tree. So it's not doing very much, but it's the same question. So what is uh, for, for each of these benchmarks, what is the benchmark which has the the maximum compactness program? So so if you, if you want the optimal program and you, uh, define the optimal program as the most compact program, and then which of these benchmarks has the largest compact comp program? Right, so I do think that the program that we find is, is, is the most compact program that can be written given these components, right? So we probably haven't, like if we haven't given it the components to make a more compact program, we probably don't know of one. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that the... the most compact program. Sorry? 300 node ASP that yeah. was the most compact. Yeah, I think so. So what happens if um, I just throw at you like a huge set of components that don't have any use in your case? Right, so um, this is a very interesting problem. So in fact, how um, this technique scales when you have a lot of components, that really depends on what kind of components they are, right? So it basically, if there are a lot of components that have types that have nothing to do with your goal, that's fine because it basically cannot cannot even make use of them, so it would just discard them immediately. But if there are a lot of components that, that combine well together and they have the types that are considered, like for example, you need like a list of integers and you have a bunch of components that produces a list of integers, then of course that um, will slow it down considerably. But we are working on more techniques that, that will make it more robust with respect to um, adding more components. For example, we're working on a very general mechanism of symmetry reduction that actually uses the types to discover the symmetries. So we're hoping that will make it better. Yeah, so, so those measurements that we made are pretty much for a minimal set of components uh, that are required for um, each program. And, uh, uh, what about cases in which the program itself requires an auxiliary function. Right, so, so that's another good question. So Syncwood would not, by default, generate a recursive auxiliary function for you because that is akin to lemma discovery in theorem proving. Um, the, the, so if you, it, when, when we're generating things like sorting algorithms, we are basically given, giving Syncwood the spec for the auxiliary function and the spec for the main function. And this is how it comes up with all those different sorting algorithms. Like if you give it insertion to a sorted list, it will come up with insertion sort. If you give it split and merge, it will come up with the merge sort. 
Um, so usually that's how it works. It turns out that if you, in the main program, if you don't just use general recursion, but you use a high order combinator like fold, it can sometimes figure out the specification uh, for um, the auxiliary function from the specification for the main function. In fact, we can synthesize insertion sort without giving it the spec for the auxiliary function, which I think is pretty cool, if we give it fold with a very generic uh, type as a component. So, so you also infer uh, lambda abstractions? Or, uh, I mean, to so say, for example, you're giving fold as a component, then you are inferring the. Right, right. Diagram. So we, we can, right. So I think we can use high order functions as components. Yeah. yeah. Which is, which is actually is the easier part in, in some sense, because um, in this refinement type system, the types, the function types are dependent on first order arguments, but they're not dependent on high order arguments. So the high order argument cannot be actually used in the type, which makes in like the type of the result of the function, which um, basically allows us to completely trans, um, translate the specification for the main goal into the specification, into the specification for the high order argument and makes it very efficient to synthesize high order arguments. Uh, uh, can it ever prove that no function exists? Well, it can exhaust the search space. So, I mean, in fact, in, in the implementation, we limit the search space so that you don't have to, like, we limit the depth of, of like, the size of the program so that you don't have to work forever. So once it exhausts the space, it tells you, oh, sorry, I didn't find anything in this space. So, I mean, you could try to run it again with a bigger space. Um, it, I, it cannot generate, I mean, actually, Sometimes it might be able to even um, tell you that there no program exists before exhausting the space. If, um, well, I mean, one example is if you don't really have components, then we just say, well, I cannot construct anything. Um, but even when you do give it a components, give it components that do can sort of compose in an infinite sort of way, um, it might be able to use those tree pruning techniques to actually say, OK, there, there are no extensions of this tree that are correct. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen those examples yet. Yeah, so when you, uh, when you look at the liquid abduction uh, in your examples, you, you have just single, single predicates. Do you learn Boolean functions over predicates or are more complicated? Uh, do you learn implications? I mean, what, what the... No, so, so, so the premise is the same as in uh, liquid types. So basically we learn conjunctions of uh, what is called qualifiers. So those qualifiers are just atomic predicate templates that are given, uh, considered given uh, to the algorithm. And what we learn are conjunctions of those predicates. I mean, those atomic predicates, I usually don't have to be provided by the user. They can be scraped from mm -hmm. the specifications of the goal and of the components, um, right? But those are, those are just um, conjunctions. But if we talk about uh, inferring um, conditional guards, this is actually good enough, right? Because we can nest conditionals. So for example, if you have a disjunction, you can express that as well. You would just have like if A, else if B. You uh, give uh, so how does the performance change with different types of specification? So uh, so there, there there might be various equivalent uh, ways of specifying the, the behavior or even partial specification, mm -hmm. right? For example, you could in fact even record input output examples in, right. the, in, the, can, in, the, in yeah. the in the specification mm -hmm. language, and then does it uh, completely change the behavior in terms of runtime and so on? Well, I mean. It, it can definitely. So if you encode something, if you want to encode something with input output examples, basically what you have to say is, well, my input has to be from one to three. And by the way, this input corresponds to this output and so on, right? And then it might generate the non-recursive implementation that just works for one, two, and three. If that one turns out to be simpler in some way or shorter than the recursive one. The point is, like, suppose now, so the, the, the test that I was, I was thinking of is suppose I want to do sorting, mm -hmm. right? And I give 10 input output examples. Now the sorting algorithm that you, you, could, you could come up with is 
much shorter than basically listing out all the tens of Yes, things. so you can. So you could do program induction, right? Right, so you could, you could definitely do that. I, I don't think this is the best algorithm if you want to do that, <laughs> because it wouldn't actually take um, advantage of the, all the information coded in those examples in a way that example-based tools can. Um, so in fact, it's, it's mostly made for um, taking advantage of all the, well, information coded in, in the types. In particular, why refinement types are so great for synthesizing uh, recursive programs is that they're just naturally inductive. So we, you have seen, um, even with this replicate example, right? So um, because we have those polymorphic types, they are basically second order specifications which, and it's very easy to make them inductive, much easier than the first order specifications used in many verification tools, and this is why it works so well. Just to add to that point, uh, here. so the search uh, is happening uh, in a more uh, enumerative fashion right now, it's not symbolic. So what yeah, is yeah, the bottleneck to mm -hmm. make the search also symbolic in the sense so the nice thing would be then actually you can incorporate many different kinds of specs, like if, for example, and then the system would leverage that as well. Right, so, so I think the challenge here is how to both make use of the symbolic search and make use of all this incrementality that comes from this, you know, modular incremental type checking. It's because... It's, so, I mean... How I think about doing symbolic search is that you kind of encode your entire search space, right? You, you kind of say, I have all those possibilities, now find me one, right? Whereas here, you're sort of s starting the search from the root. You know, you don't want to ever encode or enumerate your whole search space. Um, right, right, so it's kind of, yeah. You can actually encode those tactics in the symbolic. So, so you probably could encode exactly the same thing, symbolic, right? This, yeah, I mean, I, I thought about it, but I, I couldn't find a way. But like, I would be happy to discuss it with you on slide. Basically, choosing branches, which branch to sort of take. Right, but then one. So the problem is there's so much type information propagation, top down, and then sort of left to right and then back up and encoding all that is and, and basically the pruning happens like sort of because you choose something here the whole thing is pruned down here and then but how do you encode that symbolically right symbolically you still have to encode the whole thing yeah so just the, the act of enumeratively choosing something prunes the whole search space in a different part of the tree i think that that's hard to, to capture sorry in symbolic search Okay, more questions? Cool, so what I wanted to mention is those two um, technical contributions that I mentioned before, they actually make a big difference and we, we measured that. Um, and if you disable the round trip type checking um, and then and you just propagate type information bottom up, uh, more than uh, half of the benchmarks would time out with timeout of two minutes. And similarly, if you don't use our advanced mechanism for liquid abduction that uses unsought cores, um, but you just do naive liquid abduction that simply does breadth first search over um, those atomic predicates. Also, more than half of those uh, benchmarks time out. Okay, so as I mentioned, SyncWith is online, has a web interface, so if you ever want to play with it, uh, here's the URL, and you're welcome to do so. Um, okay, so those results are pretty impressive, I think. But the question that you might be asking yourself is, well, what can we do beyond those small little textbook programs? Because those are all in libraries, and after all, we don't want to uh, synthesize them anymore. Can uh, this type driven synthesis technology um, actually m give us something useful? Well. Um, the census technology will probably not scale um, to generating a whole system anytime soon. But uh, where this technology really shines is in programming tasks that require creating many small snippets of code uh, throughout the code base. Right? And this brings me to the second part of my talk. Um, and this part of the talk is about 
uh, enforcing information flow security. This is exactly the kind of task that requires um, many little code uh, snippets all over the code base. So let me first uh, illustrate why this is important. This is an important problem. So more and more applications nowadays manipulate all kinds of sensitive data in non-trivial ways. So imagine uh, a conference management system like HotGrab or EasyChair or in this case EDAS. So those conference management systems would have to enforce all kinds of non-trivial uh, confidentiality policies. For example, you might say that in a double-blind conference, uh, the PC members are not supposed to see authors of the paper before a certain phase, like before a rebuttal phase, for example. Or you can say that an author is not supposed to see the status of their paper, whether it's been accepted or rejected, before the notification is sent out. Right? Uh, but in fact, Many of those conference systems get those policies wrong. And here is a screenshot from uh, the EDAS uh, conference management system. And what it shows to you is like the author view. So basically here, the author can see all the uh, papers submitted to upcoming conferences. And the color coding uh, shows you the status of the paper. Green means accepted, orange means rejected, gray means withdrawn, and yellow means no decision. And the yellow is used before notification has been sent out. And as I said, in this case, the programmer, or so programmer, the author should not be able to infer whether the paper has been accepted or not. And yet, from this screenshot, you can infer that the first one of the yellow papers has been accepted, and the second one has been rejected. And that's because the value in this last column is different for the two papers. That last column actually shows you the conference session that the, the paper um, is assigned to appear in. And the author presumably knows that only accepted papers can have sessions assigned. And in fact, uh, the first paper has a value in this column and the second one has not. So this is an information leak. Uh, let's look at a simplified uh, code snippet that could have produced such a leak. Uh, in this code snippet, we will um, go loop through all the papers of um, the current uh, session user of the web application, denoted by me. And we will get the status of the paper. And then um, if the status is accepted, we will access the session assigned to this paper. And otherwise, we'll just assign an empty string to the session, and we will print the session information to the current session user. So here we assume that there's some kind of persistent storage that stores uh, some values that could be sensitive. And the program can only uh, access this persistent storage with those accessor methods, like get session and get status. And here, the print function is sort of um, our kind of simplified um, way of performing any kind of output. And it says to whom the output is going to and, and what, um, what is being printed. All right, so uh, the interesting thing about this example is that the print is not even outputting the secret value directly. But in fact, um, the secret value is just influencing what's being printed through control flow. So this is something that's called implicit flow. And this is hard for the programmer to reason about. In fact. Um, the, here is the current practice for enforcing information flow policies in this kind of systems. This is a screenshot from uh, the hot crap uh, code. So and I'm not expecting you to read the code. But what I've highlighted here are those conditional policy checks. And as you can see, they are all over the code. And in some of the modules, the size of the checks is actually approaching the size of the code. Uh, and th this can be called. Um, policy spaghetti. And obviously, this kind of checks are hard to get right. And in fact, if you think, well, why don't we just factor them out into those little accessor methods so that they don't have to be all over the code? Well, with information flow policies, this is not really possible. Because um, what kind of check you have to do depends on both the source of the sensitive data and the sink. So what sensitive data it is and where it's flowing. All right, this is why you cannot just factor it out into the accessor method. So what can we do about this? So there is an existing um, 
programming paradigm that addresses this challenge, and it's called polysagnostic programming. In polysagnostic programming, uh, the programmer just writes the code without any kind of spaghetti, um, completely disregarding information flow security. And then uh, they specify information flow policies in, in a declarative fashion uh, all in one place uh, together with those accessor methods. And in fact, if a particular uh, piece of data is sensitive, for example, here the status, we say it should be only visible to PID's authors after the notification has been issued. Um, so for this sensitive value, the programmer also specifies a public default value. And the runtime system for such a policy agnostic programming will take care that um, if the value is being printed that um, is too secret for this sync, then in, uh, it would automatically kind of substitute that value with this default public value that everyone is allowed to see. So the problem is the uh, current implementations of policy agnostic programming are all at runtime. And um, that, first of all, causes potentially prohibitive overheads. But even more importantly, it can cause unexpected behavior because the system has to make those decisions basically at runtime. And sometimes the programmer doesn't expect the effect that actually happens. So what we would like to do instead is to do some kind of a static compile time policy agnostic programming. So we would like the compiler to look at those declarative policies and go and discover that um, this particular access to sensitive data is unsafe and then replace it with a guarded access, which would only access it if it's safe and otherwise get the default value. So how do we do that? Um, there are two challenges here. So first of all, uh, how do we find all those different places where we have to um, replace the accesses with conditional accesses? Well, um, because uh, probably most of them are just fine and, and we want to do uh, minimal changes to the code. But more importantly, what should this guard be? Because, well, we can always use false as the guard, essentially just replacing the access with the default value, but then we lose a whole bunch of uh, correct behaviors of the original program, and we don't want that. So we want to find a guard that would allow us to keep as many correct behaviors of the original program as possible. And we, would also, and we also wouldn't want to do any redundant checks, because look at this example. So the policy says that the policy basically has two conjuncts. It says that um, the, uh, the viewer has to be the author of the paper and the, uh, the conference has to be in a certain phase. But here we already know that our viewer, me, is the author of this paper because we are iterating through the papers of that guy, right? So we somehow have to figure out that, that we don't have to check that anymore and we only have to check that the phase is correct, right? Um, and in fact, what we found out is that with the right encoding, we can express those policies as refinement types and use the existing refinement type checking and type-driven synthesis techniques that I was talking about in the first part of the paper to do exactly that, right? So what we propose more precisely is um, we are gonna wrap every sensitive value in an instance of this opaque data type that we call tagged. So we are basically going to tag all the sensitive values with their policies, right? And then uh, the programmers can express uh, the policies by annotating the accessor methods with those refinement types. So for example, to say that session can be accessed to anyone, we uh, tag it with the policy true. So to, uh, you read this policy as um, it's a unary predicate on the users, and it's basically saying which users are allowed to see the value. So true means public, visible to all. And to express the policy on status, we can say, well, the policy is lambda u, such that u is the author of PID, and the phase of the conference is done. And we uh, also annotate all the syncs with um, appropriate types to express that 
uh, print is only allowed to output this value if it's visible at least to this um, user it's, print, it's printing to. And note that um, this uh, policy parameter is contravariant because we want to say that um, a, a value that is more public is allowed to flow into a value that is more private, but not the other way around. So when we check subtyping between tag things, we have to reverse the policies. Right, so with this encoding, it turns out that existing refinement type checking mechanism can be used to precisely localize the unsafe access to the persistent storage. And uh, moreover, the liquid abduction technique can be used to find the weakest guard that would make this access safe. So we uh, implemented these ideas in a programming language called LIFTY. And LIFTY stands for Liquid Information Flow Types. Uh, and in LIFTY, a um, programmer uh, sp uh, writes the code in a policy agnostic way, meaning uh, it provides the policy agnostic program that doesn't have any checks in it and specifies security policies as refinement types. So in the example that I showed you before, this was a snippet from our policy agnostic code. And uh, here was a policy on the get status uh, accessor. Then um, Lifty uses um, refinement type checking to check this code. Uh, and either says that the code is OK, as it is, or um, it produces a program with holes. Namely, it replaces every unsafe access with uh, like a template for a guarded access. And in this template, both branches are known. So one branch comes from the original access. The other branch comes from the default value that the programmer specified. And what's unknown is the guard. And uh, each such incomplete guarded access comes with a local policy specification that the refinement type checking inferred. And that specification basically says, well, this is the most restrictive, the most private type that this guarded access has to have um, for the program to be safe. So as you can see, we have uh, broken down the global problem of um, in enforcing information flow security into a bunch of small independent synthesis problems, which are now very easy to solve with our type-driven synthesis techniques. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to hand those uh, little synthesis problems to basically to sync with, and we're going to use um, liquid abduction to figure out the weakest logical formula that would make this program have this type. And then it's very easy, once we have the logical formula, it's easy to translate it into a program that implements the formula. So are we done yet? Well, the check that we inserted might also be accessing the persistent storage. And the accessor method that it uses might also have a policy associated with it. So what can happen here is if this um, phase information is actually more secret than, than what we're trying to print, then we created a new leak by fixing the, the old one. And this problem is called leaky enforcement. Um, so how do we deal with this? So in the previous example, we're sort of assuming that the conference phase is like a public information that is um, accessible to anyone. But it's easy to imagine, and then in, in this case, of course, inserting this, um, this check was OK. Didn't break anything. But it's easy to imagine that there are actually a lot of different phases to conference. And uh, there are many sort of intermediate phases that um, like an unprivileged user who's not on the PC should not be able to distinguish between. So we might say we don't want the author to know if we are in the bidding phase, review phase, or discussion phase. Let's imagine that, right? So to express that, we can modify this, the policy for get phase, to say something like this. Well, I can see the phase if I'm on the PC, but otherwise, I can only see if, if a phase is submission or done. But I'm not allowed to see, uh, distinguish any of the other phases. So in fact, this. Uh, is what we call a self-referential policy because it limits an access to um, a sensitive value and um, the check itself, the policy itself, depends on the value, on, on the same value. And um, 
the policy for get status is not self-referential, but it's still sort of uh, complicated because it depends on another sensitive value. Um, but in fact, in this particular case, the check that we inserted is still OK. And uh, informally, we can reason about it this way. Well, imagine I'm not on the PC. I'm an unprivileged user. And the face of the conference is one of the ones that I cannot see, for example, review. In this case, uh, this check will always be false, because I'm checking if the conference is done. Uh, and this if will always take the second branch. So this check does not actually give me a possibility to distinguish between those secret values that I'm not supposed to be distinguished to be able to distinguish between. So this is still fine, right? But if the program made a mistake, so this is fine. If the program made a mistake uh, in the policy for get status, and instead of um, a public face like done, used a secret face like discussion, uh, and as a result, Lifty would insert this check here. Uh, this would be a problem, right? Because now, all of a sudden, if I'm an unprivileged user, um, I can distinguish between uh, discussion and the two other faces I'm not allowed to see, which is leak enforcement. This is bad. OK, so how? Um, so in fact, the po complex policies like this, self-referential policies and policies that depend on sensitive values, are very common in real-world systems like this. But um, the support for this kind of reasoning in uh, existing static verification techniques for information flow is not really adequate. At least I don't know um, of any of them that can reason effectively about this kind of policies. If you know of any, then I'll be happy to hear about that. Um, so how do um, we encode this kind of reasoning in Lifty? Well, it turns out that refinement types are really great for encoding this kind of thing. Well, let's imagine we want to specify a conditional expression as a function. So first, let's write a conventional type for this function. Well, um, like a conditional expression that just operates regular uh, pure values. So it would take a condition that's Boolean, and it take two different a's and produce an a. Right? This is simple. But now let's try to uh, describe a conditional that manipulates tag values, sensitive values. Right? So what we can say in this case is that it takes a tag bool as a condition, it takes two tagged a's, and it returns a tag a. So what should they be tagged with? Well, in a simple case, we can just tag them all with the same policy, right? We can say that um, to obtain a value with policy p, all three uh, arguments of this function should have a policy at least as public as p. Um, and we express this with um, what's called abstract refinement types. So those refinement types are parameterized by predicates. So here. Uh, the type for if is, is parameterized by the policy predicate, basically. And it says, for any policy, if you give me three things with the same policy, I'll return a thing with the same policy. But this, this is a, a, a simple way to describe an if, and uh, it's definitely safe. But this is not enough to check um, self-referential policies. Because in the case of self-referential policies, the complicated thing is actually that you want the condition in one of the branches to be more secret, in some sense, than uh, the result that you obtain. But fortunately, we can encode that as well with abstract refinement types. We just add another parameter, which is a nullary predicate, C. This C can serve as an additional conjunct in the policies of the condition and the first branch, making them, in some sense, more secret. But they're ma it's making them more secret in a safe way. And um, to see why, so we can reason in the following way. In any particular execution, C is going to be either true or false. Right? It's going to either hold or not hold. Um, if C holds, then um, this policy is not actually stronger than the policy of the result, because we have a trivial conjunct, true. If the C does not hold, from the type of the condition, uh, and the t this type of condition basically says that the result of the executing the condition has to imply C, 
So from the type of the condition, we know that if C is false, then the condition will always evaluate to false. And because of that, the else branch will be taken, and the policy of the else branch is also not more secret than the policy of the result. So this type of if is actually secure. Yeah. So in essence, this is a way of avoiding saying the word if uh, within the type of if itself. This is an encoding trick to to avoid having if have to say if in the type of then that You right? can say that too, yeah. So but basically the um, the principle behind this encoding is yet we want to encode this kind of flexible way of reasoning, but we want to stay precisely within this, this formalism of abstract refinement types, and that's because uh, they allowed uh, us to do completely automated uh, inference. So, for example, one thing that we need is that we need all the predicate variables to appear only positively in all refinements. Um, and so we achieved this here, which means that um, now the user code can just use this uh, sensitive if anywhere without any kind of type annotations. And the type inference will infer all of those policy parameters completely automatically, which is pretty cool. So, right. And in fact, Lifty provides not just this one, but a whole library of such policy combinators that the user code can use and that describe basically how different um, functions affect the policies. And some of those combinators are even high order combinators like filter. So you can say filter, the type of filter is very much similar to the type of if, except this additional parameter is not an order predicate, but uh, a unary predicate, which basically abstract the, the filtering function. And this way, using this filter, you can perform, uh, you can filter a list based on some sensitive criterion, like um, filter by author um, or by status or whatever. Yeah. Um, right, so using this, um, this approach to verification, we basically, to be able to prevent uh, leaky enforcement, we do one more verification pass after we have inserted those guards. And if everything passes, then we get a verified program with checks. And if it discovers any problems, it, it reports that some of your policies were unenforceable because basically trying to enforce those policies um, would uh, would cause more leaks. So, and our design decision was, well, that's probably not what you want. So we just tell you that your policies are um, unenforceable and then you can just go fix them. Right, so yeah, this was our example. Right, so we evaluated Lifty on uh, this <coughs> little conference management system that we wrote. Um, so we wrote it in this policy agnostic style. Uh, so we had, um, we measured the size of the code and the policies, again in AST nodes. Um, the the lifted code that was um, actually interacting with the persistent storage and performing the user actions was in total um, over 7, 700 AST nodes. And um, the size of all the policies was uh, about 100 AST nodes. And those were policies on 10 different sensitive fields, and um, um, this code implements 12 different actions that the users can do. And from um, this code, Lifty has uh, generated the, the non-policy agnostic version, the policy spaghetti version, that was uh, 12, around 1,200 uh, AST nodes, uh, which means that it generated uh, almost 500 ST nodes of checks from 100 ST nodes of policies, which is a win because <laughs> we cut the amount of policy code in uh, five. But um, so, of course, the, the biggest win is not just that it's smaller, but that it's all in one place and it's much more declarative, much easier to keep track of. And uh, Lyft, it takes uh, just over two minutes to do the whole compilation process. Um, and this whole thing. Um, is about uh, around 400 lines of code of Lifty. And we also have uh, a piece of Haskell code that inter interoperates with Lifty and does the non-security critical stuff like actual access to the database and then 
processing user input and stuff. So this thing's actually running. It's not just a um, code to, to just read. Um, right. And this basically concludes my talk. So I um, would like you to take those two points away from this talk. So for the first point is, so we are all used to um, that deductive verification can help you develop correct programs, but it's really hard to use. It's like developing a program with a deductive verifier is for heroes like Ruston and not for normal people. But um, what we learned from this work is that deductive verification can actually make programming easier, not harder. Um, and what we need to do to make this happen is concentrate on developing more expressive, more automatic, and more modular verification techniques. And the second point is that, yes, you might say that synthesis, program, program synthesis technology is not there yet to, to generate big uh, systems for you, but synthesis can really take care of your cross-cutting concerns. Uh, we have seen it do it for security, but there are other cross-cutting concerns you might, um, you might want help with, like error handling, or uh, logging, or resource usage, what name you, and people usually hate doing those kind of things because they involve tedious work all over the code, especially if you have to change some specification and then you have to change the code in a bunch of places. And, and I think this is where the problem synthesis can shine already today. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, um, is this really a problem synthesis problem? Like, are, are you finding the weakest? Why isn't this a type kind of a liquid type inference problem? So, the, okay, the, the actual synthesis is very tiny. That's why you probably don't see it. It's basically once you infer the logical condition that should go there, you actually have to synthesize a program that implements the logical condition. Um, because the, the, type, the, the type inference gives you the type of that guard, and you need to. Um, but why isn't the type most of the time just a. I mean, how, how often is the type not a Boolean itself? No, no, the, the type would tell you something like, well, it's fine if this variable is in that set, for example. And then you have to say, oh, that set is actually the set of elements of that list. So what I have to do is call alum, like call member on that list. So the pro it's, it's not really hard since this problem, but that's kind of the point, right? So like we have taken this problem that seems hard, which is enforcing information flow security, and we have translated it into those tiny synthesis problems that are so tiny that you don't even think they're important. <laughs> Which, yeah. But you, but you can imagine the, the policy being a bit more declarative than the program implementing the policy. Yeah. I mean, usually, so the, the ones that we have are not, the, the ones that we have are basically equalities and inequalities and list membership. But you can imagine things being slightly more different. This isn't a question, but this is really, really cool. Thank you. <laughs> so I have another question, actually. So can it happen that you insert checks that are not needed because of because of the checks you insert sometimes you modify the control flow so that certain parts of code, they are not accessible anymore with certain values, and you're still checking that for those values, even though those values cannot reach it. I mean, one could mm -hmm. do this later, or maybe not, I don't know. Like, is this really the minimal amount of code that you have to place? So, yeah, I think I have to think a bit more about. But basically, we we do the whole the whole type inference in one go. So basically, we collect in the type inference phase, we collect all the constraints, right, and we solve them all together. So I would imagine that that this solution is actually the minimal, like for for the for this whole for the whole function. Um, and then we just solve the census problems independently, but right. But like, what if you have a, a very long chain of function calls, mm -hmm. and it's just like the only way to make it secure is to avoid that you actually run everything after the first function, and you put an if statement. That no, but but our like uh, repair model is is fixed. Basically, we derive it from this 
uh, from basically Jean's work, right, on policy agnostic programming. So the repair model is always that you uh, guard a single access, right? And so we never guard like a whole bunch of accesses altogether, if that makes sense. Because we always have this default value. Um, And I have actually another question. So, like, some of these feels like there could be some use of MaxSat or MaxSat mm -hmm. somewhere. Right. The thing, I mean, so you mean for the abduction stuff? Yeah. So, for the abduction stuff, it's kind of like a second order MaxSat, if, if that makes sense, right? Because you have to infer, like, you have to synthesize the, the weakest predicate, not just a, like a first order value that maximizes something. No, I mean, but like, mm -hmm. yeah, you want to kind of give a bunch of conditions. Right, so in fact, yeah. like, okay, to rephrase the question, uh, not rephrase the question, but um, so I'm, I'm actually currently working with a master's student on um, making this liquid type inference even more expressive by having um, like angelic parameters inside those atomic predicates. And then, so those would be like a first order, like integer parameters. And to to solve those, then you can use all kinds of like max sat and SMT techniques to because you want to find some integer value that maximizes something, right? Whereas in the original um, liquid type inference, you just have to find like the maximum or minimum conjunction of predicates. Yeah, that, that's the part that mm -hmm. feels like max sat. Right. So uh, <coughs> you mean you would like just do this symbolically by? Uh, Calling yeah, I guess you could try to do that too. Yeah, I think Leon is doing it more this way. I'm not sure. Yeah, I have to think about it. In your leaky uh, enforcement to prevent that, <coughs> uh, why didn't you? So you had the example with the get phase, where mm -hmm. get phase then looks at if it was discussion. Why don't you just um, recursively apply? the same policy to the get phase. That is, that, that you replace that. This whole thing was replacing get status. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. now get status then apparently introduces a mention of get phase. So why not just also replace get phase by, by its appropriate policy? By get status. Uh, I get it. It's just like, no. you replace get phase right. get I stuff. mean, you hope that, I mean, that it terminates. I mean, that. Well, it is, but it, so I mean, it, it is self-referential, right? The get. You mean just get phase. Yeah. Right. So. So um, you cannot. So, so in general, you cannot do. You cannot do the replacement for anything that's self-referential, even if if the user was not. No, in fact, you. Wrote. Wait, wait, no. In fact, you can, but so what we would. So in this case, it's just that. Let me think about it. So. <laughs> the thing is, so we do replacement for self-referential things. It's just that when we, so we found that when we do discover the leaky, leaky enforcement, you you could do this, but I think this would always be vacuous. Um, or in, so I have to I have to think a bit more about what actually would happen in this case. But what we found is, um, if you are in this situation that you you came up with leak enforcement, it's usually not what you want. So usually the uh, the the, the user intuition is that the policy is wrong in this case. So yeah. Um, there are some systems that use intuitionistic logic for mm -hmm. doing problem sets. I think the idea there is that you, you if you, you get a proof from the intuitionistic specification, you can. That proof is like a type, and you can right. from the type to program. Is you know relationship to this work? Or? Well, it, it's all very similar. Right? It's all based on Curry Howard as like yeah. proofs of programs and stuff. So, so this is basically a work in that area, except that the proofs that we use are those refinement type derivations, mm -hmm. whereas they would use a different kind of like problem logic and proof. This is totally half-baked, um, but uh, it seems like a lot of the, the a lot of the trouble with this kind of get-face thing is the self-referentiality is on the same sort of level. 
Um, whereas if you if you had a kind of uh, like universe hierarchy of uh, policies about policies or policies about policies about policies, then you and you rule that in, in the type system of specifying policies, then you could get around this issue or at least prevent the user from saying this particular kind of nonsense. Well, in fact, this is kind of what's happening here because. Um, you, you can see the program can only use this accessor method to, uh, to access the value, whereas the policies themselves use the actual field, right? So here we talk about the ground truth of what phase is as opposed to what the particular user could see. So, and this is actually the distinction that allows us to handle those things so gracefully. So the biggest problem with the runtime systems is that they cannot make this distinction. Uh, they specify policies as those executable predicates that they would have to run when they try to get the value. But then of course, they, they, the only thing, the only way they can talk about the sensitive values, they can only talk about the visible value. So and to do that, they actually have to run the policy, which might leak. Exactly. So, so that, that creates this, this like bad kind of self-referentiality, and which is why they have to uh, do something smart about it or solve constraints uh, to break that, that loop. And they do that, and, and usually it works, and they come up with some kind of like maximally private uh, solution. But it doesn't work in all cases. So for example, what runtime systems cannot do are kind of negative self-referential policies. So imagine you would want to express something like a list of conflicts for a paper, and then you want to say, all the details of the paper should not be visible to people in the conflict list, which means the conflict list itself is only visible to you when you're not on the conflict list. And this creates the kind of policy that, um, yeah, and the default value is, is, is empty, right? And this, if that were allowed uh, in the runtime systems, it would create a completely unexpected behavior, which would be, which could be the following, um, like the system, is trying to decide whether to show you any kind of information about the paper. For that reason, it has to evaluate what your visible value on the conflict list is. And let's say you're on this conflict list, so it picks the default value, which is empty list. Then it uses that to evaluate the policy and says, oh, you're not on this list. Let me show you everything else about this paper. Right? So um, that is what happens with those systems, because we can use ground truth to specify policies. This doesn't happen here, so this makes it more uh, expressive. So. so you can express these kind of negative policies without, without getting stuck in that kind of weird alternate Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, it will still give you, uh, because, because you will say, right, so I, I can see the conflicts and other things about the paper if I'm not on the, if I'm not on the list, uh, conflict list. So for the conflict list, you will see the default value, which is the empty list. So you will be able to infer that something is wrong, right? So because, because you're only supposed to see it. Well, anyway, so, so the, the, the security guarantee that this approach provides is that you won't be able to distinguish between the different values that you cannot see. But in principle, you could infer that you're seeing the value, that, um, that you're seeing the default value. That's not the, the guarantee that we provide. That's why it works. Right. But yeah, because you could you could realize that the conflicts list is probably not empty, and therefore you are on the conflicts list. Okay. Um, and then and then like a, a tagged a tagged phase would be the next universe level up, or something like that. If, if tag tag, but but in fact tag tagged, uh, tag is a monad. So yeah. So in fact, the whole formalization of the whole thing is just in terms of monads. And what we have seen with, uh, with those if and, and filter stuff, they are actually all implemented in terms of just bind. Um, like an, we have like a special um, version of bind for booleans that, that actually enables all those tricks with the if. Is it, is it an index mod? I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> um, is it, so do you have like extra type indices that have the refinements stuck into them? Or, um, or is it that you have an ordinary monad and then you specify refinements on bind itself? Like with the, 
Oh. This is probably getting to the point where it's like... I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's take it over. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.